Well, um, if you want to be on, on the prayer team for Roy, just talk to Katie. She'll, she knows how to do it. You get a blank piece of paper and write your name on it. So just let us know. Uh, we would, or you could write it on your prayer card today. Just say, I want to be on Roy's prayer team, and we'll keep you updated. And I know that he'd love that, and um, we'll keep you posted as how that goes. Sound good? Oh, my goodness. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, God bless you. So we are going to uh, jump into Scripture today. We've already had so much of it because we met Jesus and his disciples at the table. Um, and um, before we do, we can't, we can't ignore the other uh, realities of today that are, um, we, I mean, this is a strange day. It's, it, election is coming, right? It, and, and nobody wants to, t- who wants to talk about the election today? Anybody? Okay, I was just checking. I was just second because, okay, I'll just throw that message away. Um, I'll do a different one. Um, also, uh, time change was interesting. I, I texted Ben today and I said, how, how are you feeling about the time change? And he said, it makes me nervous. And I said, that's right, because my phone automatically changed the time, I think. So that meant it could have either been nine o'clock or eight o'clock or 10 o'clock. I didn't know what time it was. So I, I know that it can be a little discombobulating uh, to do this whole time change thing. And I I am discombobulated as well. My wife has uh, my daughter, Ellen. They are out having a fun time in, in down south. And, uh, and don't tell her this because I'm going to fix it before she gets home. I still have the Halloween decorations on my house. <laughs> my, the, the neighborhood's starting to get worried that those are our Christmas decorations. So we have little skeletons and things hanging around the house. Okay, slow down. But Halloween was fun. We had uh, this series is called Crush Reaching the Unseen, and it's the last Sunday that we're doing it. That's why we're having a big picnic in the vineyard later today. And I couldn't be happier. 82 degrees at four o'clock. It's, you're going to wear sh- short sleeve shirts at the beginning of this thing. It's going to be a beautiful day. But we, we're talking about reaching the unseen people and going to the unseen places and having our mind expanded because God is calling us to reach the people that no one else is reaching, to be the church that is doing what no other church is doing so that we can reach the people that no other church is reaching. That is where we feel called as a church. Now, on Halloween, I had probably 400 kids come to our house. We had so many kids. We live on this little cul-de-sac, and it's kind of like this place where you say, okay, we could get as many houses per square inch, you know, and as much candy as possible, and we could do it quick. And it was so cool because there were all these faces of people I hadn't seen and didn't even know, didn't even know existed. And it and then they just kind of, after they trick-or-treated, they just kind of disappeared into the distance. I thought, am I ever going to know those people? Will I ever, will those people ever become part of my church family and my community? And, and will they be people that I'll visit in the hospital someday or that we'll, we'll break bread with or go to a picnic in the vineyard with someday? Well, there was one couple that came with their two-year-old kid, and, and the two-year-old kid looked a little, almost as cute as this. And she was just, her first Halloween, and she was on her daddy's shoulders. She came up and, and um, took the candy, and she did a very good job. And I said, oh, you look so cute. Okay, yeah, yeah. And she, she even walked up on her own, and then she walked back to her parents. She was so courageous. And they said it was her first house. I was so happy about that. And then as she left down the driveway, I, I, I kid you not, you'll never guess what she said to me as she left. There's no way that you could ever guess this. As she left, she shouted from the sidewalk, Bye, Felicia! (laughs) I said, what? I said to her parents, did she just say bye, Felicia, to me? And they said, yes, she did. <laughs> uh, uh, life, is, life is unexpected, isn't it? The most random things. And, uh, I just love it. I hope, I, I hope that girl is part of my life forever, just always coming in and just, I need her to say bye, Felicia, just every Sunday. So <laughs> find her, find her and bring her to, bring her to us. You know? <laughs> so, um, so Halloween was fantastic, all these unseen people. And um, it does kind of like open up your eyes to the reality that there are people in our midst that we need to connect more with and reach out to. And all we need to do is just give them free candy every time they come to the door, right? <laughs> um, the story that we're looking at today is taking place right after Jesus. We said those words that we read in our Bible earlier uh, about the Last Supper and when Jesus instituted this, uh, he instituted this uh, sacrament called the Last Supper. And it's an interesting thing. I don't know about you guys getting ready. How many of you are looking forward to Thanksgiving dinner? Anyone? Okay, who's not looking forward to Thanksgiving dinner? Now, I put my hand up both, so you don't know what I, my answer is. I just get to just keep putting it up and down. But... Um, I think that part of the reason people don't look forward to Thanksgiving dinner is because it kind of get out of hand a little bit sometimes, right? 
You get, get a little crazy. So check this out. This is what happens right after Jesus tells like the disciples the most intimate moment, like the most intimate personal thing he could possibly tell them. This is what happens. Not kidding you. Luke chapter 22, verse 24. An argument broke out among the disciples over which one of them should be regarded as the greatest. Can you imagine Jesus' experience? What is going on? This was supposed to be the most special meal in the world, and you are bickering. Now, of course, there were brothers. There were a lot of disciples that were siblings at that table, but that doesn't explain it all. There's this argument, and it's over the most petty thing. Who's better? Have you ever been in an argument with like a friend over who's better? Or, or, or I loved the ones when I was a kid over whose dad could beat up whose dad. Do you remember that one? Like my dad could beat up your dad. Like, what are you talking about? This is so strange. That would be such a strange thing if the dads just walked in the room and be like, all right, let's go. I'll see, you know? <laughs> well, we didn't mean that. No, um, it's such a strange, you know, simple, trivial experience. And I love how human it is. You know, I mean, if you, you couldn't make this stuff up, just, uh, they started arguing. Do you, ever, do you even remember that? From, if someone said, do you remember the Last Supper? Would you remember like this moment of argument? You wouldn't, right? That's why we read scripture. Because sometimes we get this kind of like la-la land fantasy idea of what happened. And then we read the Bible and go, oh, oh yeah. They were bickering at the Last Supper. They were arguing. They started to, as soon as the... <laughs> And I love this like really personal drawn together moment of breaking bread with one another. And one second later, the, the reality of the world crashes in. Sin crashes in and they start arguing with each other about who's better than who, right? This is what Jesus says. He, Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles rule over their subjects and those in authority over them are called friends of the people. I love that it's like friends of the people. That sounds like a new political party, doesn't it? Friends of the people. <laughs> we're friends of the people and we're gonna tell you what to do. <laughs> But Jesus is saying, that's what the kings do. That's what those people over there do. That's what the CEOs do. They're always trying to figure out who's better. But Jesus is saying, that's not what we do here. We don't argue about who's better. Not in the kingdom of God. And he goes on to say these words, instead, the greatest among you must become like a person of lower status and the leader like a servant. That is awesome. A lot of fancy business books that you'll find out there will come up with this idea that they think they invented in the 1980s called servant leadership. No, they didn't. This is what Jesus says. If you want to be a good business leader, if you want to be a good leader in your home, a lot of people think to be a leader in the home means to boss other people around. Uh uh. Good leader in the home means to serve, means to lower yourself lower than others and to lift others up. That's true courage, that's true strength. That's what Jesus, because he said these words. He said, so he said, so which is greater? The one who is seated at the table or the one who serves at it? Isn't it the one who is seated at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You know, a lot of times I think we go to restaurants and, and we think, gosh, you know what? Like the, the position of leadership is the, not the position of the person who is serving But Jesus would walk into a restaurant and he would see people waiting on tables and he said, look at all the leaders. And all these other people thinking that they're the ones who have all the power and who have all of the leadership qualities. Isn't that awesome? I I love that. And he says these words, you are the ones who have continued with me in my trials. He's saying, good job. And I confer royal power on you just as my father granted royal power to me. Thus, you will eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and you will sit on thrones overseeing the 12 tribes of Israel. Jesus is saying, so imagine going to a restaurant and the maitre d', I don't even, is that the maitre d' that asks who's sitting where? I don't know. I've never been to a fancy restaurant, so I have to ask you guys. So you ask the maitre d' and they say, okay, you know, uh, uh, which table are you sitting at? And out of the corner, you hear this voice say, uh, of Jesus saying, that he's, they're sitting at my table. Oh, we're sitting at Jesus' table? That works. That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, you've got a reservation at my table. You are part of my crew. You are going to be with me and you are going to sit eye to eye across the table with me. But there's a few things he wants you to know before you get there because that doesn't happen yet. That does happen. It's kind of like the already and not yet. The kingdom is not here yet. So Jesus says, I'm not going to break bread with you again until the kingdom is here. 
So our job is to bring about the kingdom. And Jesus wants you to know a few things about bringing about the kingdom. There are three things. The first thing is it's really, 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 really hard work. The second thing is don't give up. And the third thing is that it's really rewarding. It's the best, most rewarding experience that you've ever had in your life. Now, when we started this idea of crush, it was about two months ago, the conversation, we said, hey, there's these grapes that are not picked in the vineyards. And if we took the extra grapes and we gathered all of them and we brought them together, we could make something from them and we could maybe transition that into a wine or something else. And then that could be sold so that the money from the sale of that could go to support the poor. And we read from Deuteronomy where God said, you should not clean out your vineyards every last grape. You should take the last extra grapes and you should use it to support and provide for the widow and the orphan and the immigrant. And we said, aha, what we'll do is we'll make it so that all 100% of this thing can go toward the immigrants because they're the unseen people in our community. They're probably the ones that we have said, I love you directly to less than anybody. And we need to say it to everybody. And that's where that clarification of our church's purpose and mission, that we're going to be the church that does what no other church is doing to reach the people that no other church is reaching. That's awesome. And so we sat down with a couple of the people in the industry, the winemakers, and said, so what do you think of this idea? Do you want to lead in this idea? Do you want to be leaders of this idea? Do you want to take it and run with it? And those two people sat there and said, yeah, we want to do it. And so they started to lead. And you know what they did? They wrote letters. They made phone calls. They started to work hard. And then uh, the, they contacted some other people and said, do you want to help us lead in this idea? And they said, sure. They were farmers. And so what did the farmers do? The farmers stayed up an extra couple of hours to harvest all the grapes. When I say an extra couple of hours, it means they went to bed at nine o'clock in the morning instead of six o'clock or seven o'clock in the morning. That was sacrifice. And then the, the wine, winery that is being donating their time, they had to stop production in the middle of harvest. By the way, that is not a small deal. All of the workers are there. They're all motivated. And then they stop so that the volunteer winemaker can come in and start working and start to process the grapes that have been donated at that very moment. They have to be processed. And so to see their, them and to be there as they're donating their time and even jumping in to help out and seeing the sacrifice and the hard work then the winemaker had to show up every, I didn't know all this, they had to show up every single day in the morning to, to stir up the, wine, the grapes and then to add just the right amount of um, ingredients so that the bricks and the levels and the chemistry was just right. And they had to do that for weeks on end. Morning, afternoon, and evening, three times a day making the drive out there. And then after that, it ends up getting put in the barrel and then it's going to take a whole entire year before all of that gets put together. And then I started to talk to someone who was in the industry. I think I was Cindy Steinbeck, who is who, where we're having the uh, picnic later today. I said, hey, you know, it's a lot of work. And she said, you know what? That's not the half of it. What you don't see is all the people that have been pruning the vineyard for a year before that, been planting the grapes years before that, and all of the work that is going in for decades and decades in order to make this possible. And suddenly through this, I feel like Jesus is kind of using this as an example in the life of our church. If you want to experience a fantastic, great, huge harvest in your life, then it's going to be a lot of work. And as a leader, I've started to discover that setting expectations is everything. Actually, in life, setting expectations is everything. It's not a good idea to tell your kids that you're going to Disneyland if you're really going to Trader Joe's, right? <laughs> Bad idea. What's going to happen? Tears, right? It's better to tell them that you're going to a garbage dump. And then you go to Trader Joe's and they're like, yeah, better than a garbage dump. Actually, they, they'd like the garbage dump. I was trying to think of something worse than Trader Joe's. Um, <laughs> and I wasn't going to go there. So anyway, because uh, <laughs> I was like, because that's someone else's best. Someone, my worst is someone else's best. So, so what I learned is setting expectations is everything. When you meet with somebody, you need to help them understand what the expectations are. And if you set those expectations in a realistic way, say, hey, you know what? This is going to be a lot of work. You're going to have to put in your time. And then when they get into it and they say, hey, you know what? There was a lot of work involved. And I said, yeah, but we expected that, right? We knew. Jesus is talking to you too, not just the disciples. And he's saying, you know what? If you want to follow Jesus, if you want to be a part of this experiment of mission to serve and to love, then you are going to need to work hard. You're going to have to work really hard. 
I love this uh, scripture that says that the gate that leads to life um, is narrow, right? Is narrow and the road is difficult, so few people find it. Almost people, anybody, hardly anyone can find it and they can't even navigate it because it's so hard. Other translations say that, that it's the rocky road, that following Jesus is the rocky road. That's why I say Jesus' favorite ice cream is rocky road. That just makes sense, right? It's intuitive. It has to be. Go tell your friends that and they'll say, what kind of church do you go to? That's weird stuff they're teaching you. But you'll remember it next time you have rocky road, won't you? The second thing that Jesus wants to tell you is don't give up. Don't give up. Remember the movie Waterboy where that man yells out from the sidelines and he says, you can do it. Remember that guy? You don't remember that guy, but I remember him. And he said, you can do it. And, that, and he meant it. And this is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, don't give up. There's a lot of people I feel like they start to get down that road a little ways and they say, you know what? I thought that the path of following Jesus was easy and if it's not easy, then this must not be the way of Jesus. And guess what the Bible says and what Jesus says? Huh? uh Actually, one of the signs that you're on the right path is that it doesn't feel like the right path. It feels like the wrong path. It feels really hard and sometimes you have to climb over boulders and you have to, oh, it's so difficult. And Jesus is saying, don't give up. I love these two scriptures. This one's from Galatians 9. It says, let's not get tired. Let's not get tired of doing good, right? Or doing radical mission experiments to turn the world's mind upside down so that we can be the church that does what no other church is doing to reach the people that no other church is reaching. Don't get tired of that because you thought that there was going to be an overnight success, didn't you? You thought, hey, we're going to do this thing and suddenly the whole entire world is going to be transformed and it's going to be like Disneyland. It's more like Trader Joe's. No, that was a terrible. <laughs> Let's not get tired of doing good because in time we'll have harvest if we don't give up. In time we will have a harvest. A lot of people in this world are looking for an overnight success. They're looking for an overnight trans transformation and it just doesn't, it's not the norm. We've taken what is the anomaly or the different thing, the one instance, and said, hey, you know what? That is what everybody should look like. And there's almost no overnight successes. Do you guys know about Tiger Woods? He's still trying to, trying to get good at what he's doing. And this guy, do you know where he's from? Anybody know? Atascadero. Isn't that crazy? Who knew? Could anything good come from Atascadero? I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, <laughs> like, everybody leaves. Um, so, <laughs> that's amazing, right? So, but did he just suddenly wake up and be a great golfer? Well, he's probably pretty darn good, like, from the get-go. But he, he was practicing day and night, early morning before school. He was out at, you know, um, Hunter Ranch Golf Course, which is weird to me, <laughs> just practicing and practicing and practicing. What a, what, a, what a testament to us, because a lot of times we see people who we think that they're actors or they're musicians or they're politicians or they're whatever you see in the terms of leadership, CEOs, whatever else it is, and you kind of think, hey, you know what? Uh, what happens is there's just like this lottery moment and suddenly you get all these things and then you find yourself in a corner office with a latte and there's no work left to do. But that's not how it works. In fact, if you want to find the most burdened people in the world, I can show you a lot of people who have corner offices that have lost their life because they've been trying to gain the world. See, Jesus says that if you want the, if you want the real path of following Jesus, then it's going to be one of serving others. That even if you have the corner office, you're going to know how to occupy it because you're going to be one who serves others, that humbles yourself before others and lifts others up. There's no other way. You know, if you go through the Bible, there's this great, um, great verse in Romans chapter 12, verse 8. I love the whole, if people have said, hey, what scripture should I memorize? I say, always start with Romans chapter 12. It's just such amazing stuff. Um, but there's this little description of the gifts that are given by God, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Last week we talked about none of this can be accomplished without the Holy Spirit, right? And so this, these are the gifts that God gives to people and they, they open up realms of possibility for you to serve in different areas. And so one of them, this list is kind of like a no duh list because it says the exhorter and ex exhortation. By the way, Roy is a great exhorter. He can exhort, ex he has great exhortation. The giver and generosity, right? These are the gifts. So the giver will have generosity. The exhorter will have exhortation. And the leader in what? Diligence. What an interesting quality to associate with leadership. Diligence. 
That, 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 that ability not to give up, just keep working away at it, keep plugging away at it, one day after another, one step, one foot after another. My favorite last one on that list is the compassionate in what? Cheerfulness. How many times do you think people think they're being really compassionate, but they're just really Debbie down? Everything's terrible. I love you though. No, <laughs> it's not compassionate. It's just like straight up. Compassion is cheerfulness. You're going to draw, you're going to like, <gasps> Be diligent equals don't give up. There are no overnight successes, and, and this thing is the long haul. One of my favorite moments this last week was meeting this beautiful woman named Aura in her home. And she is days, in some ways minutes away from entering into eternal rest and peace and joy with Jesus. I love visiting her and her body just starting to stop. And as I walk in the room, she has this Bible open and she's reading like the prophet Micah and she has this big glowing smile over her face. And as we were singing that song, ever be on my lips, ever be on my... I thought about what I encountered this week and how my instant reaction was, I want to be like that. I want to be filled with joy, not a show, just to be spending. She says, the time I spend with Jesus is so beautiful and so perfect. And, and, and that is the long haul. That's the rocky road. And that, you get that with diligence. You get that with 15 minutes a day, opening your Bible and speaking with Jesus and, and waiting on Jesus and serving other people. I loved what she said. She said, I said, would you like to see my kids? Should I bring them in? She says, oh, yeah. I said, do you like kids? She said, 32 years of teaching children's ministry. You don't think I liked kids? <laughs> what a servant. What a leader. That is, the, that is the woman that will be sitting down in almost no time at that table with Jesus as the kingdom of God is brought about through one more person. And... The last thing that Jesus says, which is so beautiful, is um, there's no bigger reward for this hard work. It is hard work, but it's so rewarding. That experience when you see someone who came into your life and they felt, they knew and they were right. The world had given up on them. The world had discarded them and told them that they were no good. And they left them there. And, and, and they came in and they, they had internalized this message of there was no worth and no value to them in the world. And you see this person transformed into a place where they discover their infinite value, where they realize that Jesus died for them on the cross, that Jesus loved them so passionately that, that it was, it, his body was broken, not just for other people, not just for some obscure person, but for them. And then that, that moment when you see it become real in their lives and their heart and their mind light up and they become this person that is welcomed into a journey that is not the easier part of the journey of their life, but the harder one. But it's vital and it's beautiful. And the reward is, is actually infinite. Have you ever heard someone say infinite rewards? In this case, it's real. There are infinite rewards because what Jesus is welcoming us into is an experience of being at Jesus' table in the coming kingdom, which will take place after this kingdom has been established, which must happen through the power of the Holy Spirit coming about in your life and bringing good into the lives of others so that the kingdom is established so that the people who are unseen are finally seen, so that there is suddenly this discovery among people who've said and been told, God doesn't like you, God doesn't want you, God, and they suddenly discover that God really, truly loves them passionately and will never give up on them and is always going to be chasing after them. And that God is willing to do the hard work. You think you have hard work? Jesus says, you think you have hard work? I am going to do the hardest work and I am going to do it for you so that you can be welcomed into my hard work and you can experience joy. Now, you know what? One word that I love that is similar to diligence is the word faithfulness. But I love that you can kind of break that word down into faithfulness. And the Bible tells us that faith is a gift from God. Did you know that? 
Actually, faith is something that God gives you. It's something that you are given by God through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a gift to you. And so when you discover faith, I, there's a great burden that's taken off your shoulders when you realize that faith comes from God, isn't it? You can kind of say, oh, wow, instead of beating yourself up for not having more faith, you can instead say thank you to God for the faith that you do have. And God says that when you have a thankful heart, you'll receive more. And when you are good with what you've got, you're going to get, it's going to expand. And so instead, enjoy that faith, but know that the, our faith is a response to God's faithfulness to us. And God calls us into a life of faithfulness to God. And so then we get to experience this, this joy of bringing our faith in, that has been given to us as a gift into the lives of others. And to see that transformation and to, be, to welcome them into the greatest reward imaginable. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are so thankful. We're so thankful that you have set the expectations realistically, that we are not in any way deceived by the journey in front of us, but we know what is to come. It's hard work. We thank you that you will continue to speak into our lives the words don't give up through our neighbors, our friends here at Highlands as we embrace one another on this difficult journey and as we set out on some of the biggest challenges and tasks that we've ever had in our entire life and we do it out of response to the faith that you give us. And we thank you, God, that we have an eternal reward in you. Not a reward that's taken away and given and taken away, but it's one that rests eternally before us. That you have welcomed us to the table, that you don't disinvite us from that table, but it always stands before us as a testament to your goodness and your glory and your love. And so thank you, God, for this gift. May each one of us step out from this place with this proclamation of your love to those who are furthest from you that don't know about your goodness. May we run into the vineyards and the fields of this world and share the truth of who you are. We praise you, God, and pray this in Jesus' holy name. And all God's people shouted, Amen. Amen.